Hello, I'm Atu Jamir and you're watching On Real TV. In a landmark decision, the Supreme Court on Thursday said daughters of Hindu fathers would be entitled to inherit his self-acquired and other properties obtained if the father dies without making a will. The judgment which came on an appeal against the Madras High Court verdict dealt with the property rights of Hindu women and widows under the Hindu Succession Act. The court's order is significant for Indian women in general and indigenous women in particular such as Naga women due to the fact that customary laws continue to be a point of contention. In this regard, we have Advocate Rupin Sang Jamir and our Senior News Analyst El Muli to give us the legal and economic perspectives of women's inheritance rights, especially in the context of Nagaland. So, hello? Hello. Okay. Hello. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I okay. can hear you. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for joining me today. Yes, thank you for inviting me to your show. All right, so moving on with this discussion, sir, uh, sir, uh, sir Pinson, I would like to come to you first. So since yes. we're talking about in, uh, property rights here, could you please tell us uh, you know, more about the difference between inherited property rights and also acquired property rights? Because I think our viewers might also want to know the difference and know, uh, get to know more about it, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, regarding the inherited property rights, it means the right to inherit which naturally confers upon a person by person especially a member of the family so here the inherited properties are usually those properties those are ancestral properties which pass on through generations by way of right to inherit mostly through paternal lines male lines for this uh, i'll give you an example Right, if a particular clan in a village possesses a blood of land, that blood of land is generally inherited by the male members only, excluding the of the same clan, exclu excluding the female members. That's the in, uh, inherited properties. On the other hand, acquired properties are those properties which are earned or acquired by the owner himself or herself, by his own money or her efforts. So normally self-acquired property can be disposed of by the owner himself without taking the consent of other legal heirs, which is restricted in case of inherited ancestral properties. That's the difference. All right, sir. Also, moving on to the next question, uh, the Supreme Court's order is mainly about inheritance rights of Hindu women's inheritance. What does yes. India's inheritance right say about women from other religious communities as well? For other communities, uh, the question is, uh, uh, the scope is very big, so I won't go into the details. Yes, sir. But uh, for Christians in Muslims, mostly the... Uh, Succession is governed by the Indian Succession Act 1925. Okay. So the, that act doesn't bar a woman from inheriting properties. So even a widow is given the right to inherit properties. I'm not giving it, uh, going into the details because it's very fast, vast. So even a widow has got a right to inherit. So, so uh, are we talking about acquired property rights here or? So, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, okay, sir. The, the, the uh, context is very big. Okay, so, okay. it uh, varies from community to community. It varies from tribe to tribe. So, I'm not going into those details now. All so, right, sir. what I'm trying to say is the egg gives the right to women to inherit properties, both uh, ancestral as well as uh, inherited as well as acquired properties. Right, there sir. is still scope. Right, sir, I'll request you to stay online, sir. I'll talk yes. to our senior analyst here who, is, who will be joining sure, us sure. from our newsroom, sir. Okay, so El, generally how does the fact that women not being able to inherit property affect localized economy? Could you please uh, give us some details on that? Yeah, uh, too, thank you. Uh, Globally, about 41 person, yeah, about 41 person of woman-led households. I'm not saying woman in general, but woman-led families and household 
they live in uh, categories of below poverty line. So 41% of women-led households in the world live under the below poverty line. And about one third of the population of the world, they, live, they are either homeless or they live in very inadequate or poor housing facilities. Now, now how does that relate to an economy? How does a woman, not ha a woman not having property relate to that local economy? Now, this is interesting. The reason is, Women, especially in Southeast Asian countries and indigenous communities, say, let's say Nagaland or even in the Northeast, they are the central workforce of the e agricultural economy. So when a woman he does not have, she does she does not own property, it means she is forced towards urban areas. So there is no workforce in the rural areas. So she pushes on towards the cities to find work. And when you go to the cities, you don't, f you don't start living in a palace and you start earning millions. You join a category of economic groups that are below the normal uh, low earning income groups. They are normally people who are under the below poverty line group. So they live in poor housing. They live in a very bad um, infrastructure where there are no facilities for them. So this same woman, they come to live in such kind of a society and they start families. So when you start families again, your economic burden is increased. So the pressure is to create more assets when you don't have an investment capital. You're trying to create a future, a future for your children when you don't have money. So it is a cycle that is passed on to the children and the children will pass that cycle on to their children again. So that is how there is a correlation between a poor economy and women not having property rights. Of course, women not having, uh, men not having property has also a context of correlation with the local economy, but more so about women because women are the central workforce, especially in the society and especially in agrarian societies, let's say like Nagaland and the Nordis are too. All right, El, thank you for that. We'll get back to you. Now, moving back to you again, sir. Uh, yeah, hello? I'm hearing you. Yeah, hello, sir? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sir, moving back to you. Uh, we would want to know what do customary laws say about Naga women acquiring property or inheriting property in the light of Article 371 and applicable uh, to Nagaland, sir? Mm, Article 371 does not say that women should be given the right to inherit, or it does not say that it should not be given. It only safeguards the rights of religious and social practices of the Nagas, Naga customary law and procedure, etc., and etc., land ownership and transfer, etc. So, Article 371 gives us the liberty to use or apply our customs according to our wishes. So it depends upon us. It doesn't forbid, it doesn't allow, Article 371. So the uh, customary law, it depends upon us. So here, every tribe and every community has its own customs and traditions. We, we Nagas as a whole doesn't have a common customary law. Yes, sir. So it, uh, varies from tribe to tribe and community to community among the Nagas also. And uh, one thing I wish to mention here is that uh, even Naga women, in respect of movable properties, they have more rights to inherit in uh, uh, with, compared to immovable properties like land, houses, etc. So, Naga customs also allow women to inherit properties. The only problem I see is they have less rights in inheriting properties compared to the male counter counterpart. Yes, sir. So, we still have a right, but the rights are very less compared to uh, men. 
Uh, going into the details uh, and in this context, so do the women in Nagaland inherit property in the absence of male heirs? And because customary laws are enforced, do they face problems legally in inheriting such property? Mm, yes. Naga women can inherit properties, but as uh, you have asked, there are a lot of hindrances in uh, inheriting such properties, especially immovable properties. See, uh, the Naga custom and tradition is very deeply rooted in our past practices, where women were uh, not given the full freedom to inherit properties, especially immovable properties. So even today, those practices are uh, applied not only in the village areas, but even in rural areas, those, uh, where most of the people try to apply those laws, those uh, customary practices. I've come across uh, some incidents where the father and mother they acquired land and properties in Kohima and Dimabur. Yes, sir. But the the father left uh, without a legal uh, male son, yes, without a son. So the other legal years from the father's side, he took the uh, property as the right. Such. Uh, problems still we can face it we, we are facing it all right sir we're talking about rights here so there are uh, all these rights that protect women or that you know benefits us do you think all these rights are made aware I mean people in the forget about us or uh, forget about people living in the urban areas but do you think the people living in the uh, rural areas are aware about all this all these rights that could benefit them sir That's a question to me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Say, even in the urban areas, we, we have a conflict of uh, understanding as well, as well as conflict of laws. There's a conflict of customary practices in conflict uh, with the uh, modern laws. So still in uh, urban areas, we are facing such problem. So in rural areas, the case is worse. Yes, so if the rural people are also uh, educated, uh, if we, they are informed properly, it will greatly benefit the Naga society in general. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move back to the newsroom to our senior analyst L. Okay, so L, um, as Sir has rightly pointed out about you know the you know uh, about the people in rural areas not uh, rural areas not being much aware of it. Could you also tell us you know how what can the government and also us as a society do to you know uh, be make people more aware about all these rights and laws? Uh, yes. Just as our guest has pointed out just recently about how the, there is so much conflict about customary law, customary laws, and constitutional laws when it comes to inheriting inheriting property, and if an urban area could have so much problems, then imagine what could be the fate of those people living in the rural areas. I think the best weapon that we have right now is education. Uh, I, I have never, ever, ever, ever come across any chapter unless I decided not to buy the textbook. But I have never come across any book, any publication, especially in the new, in the in the schools and colleges that I read in. I don't think we have be ever been taught about the traits and the customs of our communities and tribes, and especially when you talk about something as complex as inheritance rights and properties. I think these are things that should have started at a school level. So being being someone from the city, I, I don't know how all these inheritance 
rights and property inheritance rights work. So I can, I can imagine that there will be a lot of problems in the rural areas. So I think the first tool that we have is education at the school and primary, primary levels, the schools and the colleges. And then of course, there's the role of the Ganburas, for instance, or village council and community leaderships. I think they can engage the community in a very big way about teaching them what their rights are, what are allowed and what are not allowed, for instance. It could be about community building, it could be about inheriting, inheriting properties, it could be about family laws. So I think it's not just the government but the schools and then the rural community leaderships and as for the government, I do, I do believe that uh, having a legislation that it focuses and give, gives an emphasis on education of the people about our cultural heritage, and I don't mean the, just the music and the dancing, but about our cultural heritage of knowledge, our literature, our laws, I think it, that will be really wonderful because these are the tools that will give us insights to our identity. And true understanding of this identity, we can have, we can have a, a personality that encompasses not just an understanding of what our culture is, but we can also have an understanding of what a big worldwide view is and it will give us a window into the world outside our too. Right, Al. Also moving on with the economic aspect of this matter. Um, you know, Al, not having property can affect some men too, but what is the mm. correlation to children being affected more if women do not inherit property? Could you please enlighten us on that as well? Yeah, uh, I'd just like to cite, cite data to contextualize the answer that I'm, give, I'm about to give to the question here. In the United States, uh, about 65% of all custody battles uh, are won by women and 35% are won by men. Mm -hmm. So this is practically to say that 65% of all legal uh, custody cases in the United States uh, are all won by women, which means they take the children 65% of the time and w men, they take the children only about 35% of the time. Now, uh, in India, out of 90 cases every year for custody of their children, it is the female parent that takes it all the time. In fact, out of 90 cases, uh, Atu, I think you'll find this very interesting, only two cases every year goes to the male parent, that is the father. The father wins only about two, twice out of the 90 cases every year. So this suggests this suggests that women's, the, the well-being of the woman means the well-being of the child. Right. So the correlation of a child's well-being is related directly to the resource capital, the resource foundation of the woman, of the mother. So the context of this uh, data is that single mothers, especially uh, uh, single mothers who are divorced and even single mothers who are not married, they are going to raise children. They are the sole bread earners of their family. They are the sole caretakers of their children's welfare. So if that woman has no property, acquired or inherited property, it means that she has no, she has no resources that will ensure well-being of her children so actually there is there is data that shows that women who have inheritance rights uh, uh, excuse me who have inherited property and have inheritance inheritance assets they are more likely to give good education to their children which means they are investing in a little better future than children who don't have mothers who have no assets especially inheritance, inherited property are too. So this is the correlation why women who can inherit, it, inherit rights and women who don't have that rights can have an impact on their children's economic lifestyle, life later in the future are too. Thank you so much. I must thank say you. we had a very informative session today. Thank you so much.